so let me just give you give you guys a quick introduction about what this what this panel is and then i'm going to introduce this panelist to you guys and we can start the session so the panel is basically aimed at discussing about the philosophy of ai as in when we talk about artificial intelligence the idea is we essentially are trying to recreate human intelligence in some way so philosophy is an integral part of it and i think it becomes undeniable to like you know not even think about uh, philosophy when we're talking about artificial intelligence right so that's the key aspect of this panel and that's the aim I and mean, that's kind of what we're trying to like you know uh, put light on so we have two panelists here today we have mr mr vendo walak and prakar gupta Mr. Wendell Wallach is a lecturer, project coordinator at Yale University for, like, you know, for interdisciplinary center of bioethics. He also chairs a technology and ethics working research group. He is also an author with a lot of popular books. Some of them that you might know are Moral Machines and etc. And then we have Mr. Prakar Gupta. He is a Columbia University student, and uh, I like to call him psycho philosopher. And he is also a podcast host of PG Radio and also a popular YouTuber. So I think yeah, over to you guys. You, you, you could just start this discussion, like introducing yourself, or the start of the discussion. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> I'll kick the ball. Good morning, Mr. Wallach. Welcome to India on the digital real estate. How are you doing? Doing okay. You and I are actually a lot closer to each other than most of our audience at the moment. <laughs> yes, we've been we've been chatting, and I mean, I'm 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 rather confused. I'm I'm confused in the sense because. I want us to start off in a place where people at least begin to understand what the problem it might be that we might attempt to solve throughout this conversation, whatever limited time we might have. And so um, I was talking to you about how it might feel for you now that you've been speaking about machines and technology for so long to suddenly be surrounded to the point where, you know, our actual interface is through a two dimensional screen in front of my eyes. Right. Um, and you told me that it's sort of been happening throughout your life, that we've been almost always surrounded by technology. I want to wonder for this young audience, on behalf of this young audience, I want to wonder what is new about what is coming? What is unique about the transformation that we might expect going into the future? Well, I think what is new is we are having much more control and we are introducing new biological and technological artifacts, entities that we hitherto for only kind of dreamed about. <clears throat> so it's moving away from science fiction on those fronts into synthetic biology and artificial intelligence for real. Up to this point, we have had increasingly powerful computational systems but whether they really had any artificial intelligence or not, most of us would say no. But with this deep mind or deep learning break breakthrough, we're suddenly having systems whose activity is pretty difficult for us to explain. So they are displaying at least certain forms of intelligence, even if those are still higher order statistical learning. In the same realm in biology, we now have synthetic biology and we are producing biological products and even organisms that hitherto for could not exist. Or we are engineering new forms of existing organisms that could actually be introduced into the wild and, for example, replace existing species. So now we have had, what shall I say, emerging technologies for hundreds of years, perhaps you can argue thousands of years, but at least since the Industrial Revolution. But this all speeded up throughout my lifetime after World War II, and suddenly we are moving into these realms where we actually have some entities, both biological and artificial, that we can create and introduce into the into the commerce of daily life. Hmm. Hmm. I do sense, though, as far as this conversation is concerned, even for the for the uh, as far as the fact that Andrew Yang was contesting his election in the United States on the premise of something similar, that there is an anticipatory anxiety kind of a situation as far as what this new breakthrough, this automotive breakthrough, or for that matter, this AGI um, breakthrough might do. And it seems like this anxiety has sort of something to do with the loss of control. Like it's almost as if we are, you know, renouncing autonomy onto or like providing autonomy to these machines to make our decisions going into the future a lot more. Am I am I correct in understanding that? 
Well, yes and no. So AGI, artificial general intelligence, or ASI, artificial super intelligence, these are still highly speculative. Right. And even though you have people like Ray Kurzweil who say that that may occur within the next 25 years or so, um, there are many researchers within the fields of artificial intelligence who say, no, that's not occurring very soon. Mm. But that said, we are still introducing autonomous systems, whether those are car or lethal autonomous weapons, that are able to do actions with little or no human intervention. And in that sense, there are the dangers that we are abrogating responsibility, authority to those systems, and they might in real time act in ways that, for example, would create a new war or mm. escalate an existing one or cause an accident that the humans involved had no idea that the machines could do. Now, again, this is not totally new. We've had automatic pilots on planes now for, for decades, and we've learned a lot about when it's appropriate to turn over control to the systems and when it isn't, and there have been some accidents that have occurred. We've refined systems. So this is not a totally new process. But as, in, as we move more and more toward intelligent systems, systems that actually have cognitive capabilities, we have two things going on. One, the concern that they will decimate increasing numbers of jobs, regardless of whether they have full intelligence or not. Most jobs don't require some kind of sophisticated intelligence. But also we have this ongoing philosophical reflection about the ways in which we humans are similar to or maybe dissimilar from the artificial entities we will create. And therefore, whether there's really a place for us or whether over the coming decades they will start to usurp all of our functions. Now, I happen to be among the group that is, I call myself the friendly skeptic when, we, mm. when it comes to artificial general intelligence. I'm friendly to the can-do engineering spirit. I'm deeply skeptical that we know enough about intelligence or consciousness or other human capabilities to be able to reproduce them in artificial systems. But that said, um, it's a fascinating philosophical reflection as to what we might be able to do and can't do. Mm. Right. But, uh, <coughs> I'm afraid I'm going to cough a few times during our, uh, so my apologies to the audience. Um, if I understand the argument, like I understand the line of reasoning where you're like, you know what, we don't really understand what intelligence is made out of, much less what consciousness is made out of, much less what creativity or any of these things are made out of that actually make the world turn as far as human actions are concerned. But to this, I can easily see a mathematically inclined engineer, a computer scientist say something like it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of more math and more computational power before we begin to understand that. And what do you say at that point? Like, is it not an inevitability that we have machines or silicon life of some nature, if not life, or silicon operating systems of some nature that totally replace the need for carbon-based agents um, in the system? What do you think? Well, I think it's theoretically possible, and uh, many of the people who are saying this are among my close colleagues. <laughs> right. Philosophy, and and we debate vigorously about whether it's possible or, or not. But as any good engineer would say, the proof again is in the pudding. Can you engineer the system? And we are certainly going to probe over the next few hundred years, if mm -hmm. not you know, thirty years. We are going to pro probe what can be achieved through at least the artificial intelligence platforms we have and perhaps through combining artificial intelligence with human intelligence, or at least other forms of biological intelligence. So we have started walking down that road. Um, it's a philosophical quandary, who's got it right? The, the philosophy of AI, which is in the name of our discussion here, right. the philosophy of AI, at least from the perspective of those developing it is that it is reproducible computationally, that it's just a matter of, 
of organizing the right number of bits, firing in patterns similar to the way the human brain fires synaptically, um, that we have already crossing the threshold of having computational power equivalent to the human brain, but not in a single system, and that it may be just a matter of time before we can organize that system, and once we organize it, that it will have emergent properties such as consciousness. But mm -hmm. whether consciousness really is something that will emerge out of the computational digital platforms we have today, or whether consciousness requires a biological platform, or whether consciousness, for example, is a quantum phenomena that would require a quantum platform to manifest, all of that's unknown. Mm. So this is not to, this is not to de deny the possibility. The possibility is just to reflect upon what is the nature of the phenomena we are trying to reproduce and which of it is natural to the platforms we are dealing with today and which actually may demonstrate the limitations of those platforms. Mm -hmm. There's a very famous philosophical uh, dilemma that John Searle put forward many years ago called the Chinese Room. So right. as a psychology student, you know the Chinese room. I do. I definitely do. <laughs> yes. And, right. and Searle was just dealing with the simple fact of the Turing test. Mm -hmm. And he was proposing, and in his case, he was using the Chinese language. But for your audience, we can do it with Hindi or Bengali or whatever the language is. And he, right. and he was saying, um, if... If you put me in a room, he had many versions of, of this Chinese room, but he said, if you put me in a room with all the, all the textbooks and the, and the formulas and so forth that the computer was using, I might get right answers to Hindi questions or Sanskrit questions would be better, to Sanskrit questions, but, 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 but I still don't know Sanskrit. I'm just engaged in certain mechanical processes in this in this form you're saying i'm just engaged in certain syntactical processes but i don't understand the language i don't understand the semantics mm -hmm. and his point was the digital computing is not the same as semantic understanding now that said since john Searle put forward the chinese room any of you who Google it, we'll find thousands of articles and even books refuting his point that digital platforms can't have understanding. But the verdict is still out because we really don't have computers with any kind of semantic understanding or the kind of semantic understanding they can demonstrate isn't, isn't the kind of conversation you and I are having right now. Right. Right, at least the dynamic part of it. You know, what was very interesting to me um, going through the history of psychology was at that the, let's say the most modern of ideas in psychology, which is the cognitive way of looking at, you know, the mind came about only after we'd constructed a computer and we could sort of look at ourselves as if the mind was a computer and we discovered that there is one way to deal with the problem of how we think in a very similar fashion to the computer. And you know how we were talking about earlier, <clears throat> I think the cognitive part gets accounted for pretty much in all discussions. I think what we miss out to a great degree is the biological part of our computation, our, our arrangement as a system, right? And it's to say that there is, I've noticed very often, a creeping anthropocentric, human-centric bias that slips in and off in more than one conversation about AI. So for instance, John Searle's paper, um, he frames intentionality in my view and i and i wrote a casual like just a refutation of it not very long ago he he frames intentionality as private mental stimuli or private mental representation if i'm not wrong and to which i would say that a computer has intentionality as a private binary stimuli as a pri private binary representation my it, it becomes very difficult for me to separate the biological from my thinking entirely. And so when I look at a computer, it is almost as if I attribute the anthropocentric bias to it. Do you think that's an accurate observation or um, 
do you think I'm wrong about it? No, I think that I think that's a pretty good point. I mean, again, what that all means is, is up for debate. The, right. the difficulty that has happened with the computational theories is that as we move toward having computers, we started to overlay how the computers worked on human capacity. And it's not totally clear that that's how humans function. And therefore, so we equated, let's say, a bit of information with a synapse firing. But it's not clear that, for example, you can reduce the human brain to synapses firing. So again, right. this became a computational overlay that was used to interpret human psychology. And since that time, we've had a, a lot of work done in the very area that you are, you are bringing up right here are aspects of at least the biological mechanism that perhaps don't function according to this kind of simplistic digital notion of how brain and mind work. And furthermore, we are embodied beings. Mm. So when you get into the philosophical conversation, the philosophical conversation becomes very much, well, what are the assumptions that operate when you use a digital metaphor and you overlay that on the human? Or what are the assumptions that get mixed in when you take a human anthropomorphism and you overlay that on the activity of the computer? Mm. And it's, um, you know, we're sort of lost in that because people anthropomorphize all the time, but it's not clear that the attributes that they are they are anthropomorphizing that the computers have, that they even have those in the most rudimentary sense. And right. in the same sense as we talk about ourselves as computers, right. that we have these computation, that it is computation going in on the mind. And yes, there is computation going on in the mind. We know that. And we've actually given Nobel Prizes to people, for example, who have deduced some of the computation going on in the hearing parts of, of the brain. But that doesn't mean computation is all that's going on. Right. So the deeper we get into that, we say, well, there, perhaps there is something that, that it is like to mm. be a computational machine in the same way as there's something that it, it is like to be a human, to be embodied in the world, to have your environment filtered through this biological mechanism, to engage the world in the way that we we would engage it biologically and physiologically given the kind kinds of beings we are and mm -hmm. then of course there's the the consciousness or spiritual questions about whether there is something else also going on um, that is either separate from more likely entangled with the biology that is an that is enabling some of our capabilities, some of our states of mind, and could a computer be replicate that with that in a way that it would give rise to forms of consciousness, even if they aren't exactly human-like forms of consciousness. So mm -hmm. all of that gets us into this deeper question of, well, what the hell are we trying to do? Right, <laughs> you know? exactly. Are we but trying to reproduce humans? Are we trying to create human-like capabilities? Or are we probing into realms where we can extend intelligence and consciousness into into areas where we are actually creating new forms of consciousness and intelligence through our computational experiments. Right, right. When I when I was listening to you talk, um, I think somewhere on YouTube for the first time, I was thinking, I was like, this seems like a mountain too large for me to scale, even like abstractly, because the, the first question is, who the hell am I? Like to 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 create something that is say, for instance, better, more advanced or anything relative to me, I need to first understand the basics, uh, which is wh where is, where does my morality come from and where, where do where do my ideas come from? And before I get into the ethics, morality and consciousness part of it, which which I think we'll do just right after this question, I have I have one more doubt and I want to I, I just want to get your um, opinion on the subject. Very often there is a very naive form of um, anxiety that sneaks in around conversations of emerging AGI and such, which is that of which that which sort of assumes a competitive state. 
that humans will have with the AI, which is that, you know, we are creating our own demise and blah, blah, blah. This, this is going to be the end of it. And I wonder, I wonder if, if there is no embodied intentionality, let's just say, if there's no embodied sense of spirit in, 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 in the system, if there is no biology, there is no need to be selfish. If there is no need to be selfish. There is almost no need to compete. Our, our competitive instinct comes from the biological aspect. I think it could be a very co-inhabiting, co-existing kind of a future. What do you think? Is that, am I thinking on the correct, am I on the correct path when I'm thinking about it or am I wrong? Well, that's a possibility. And right. I, I think the real difficulty we have is the intentionality is coming from the humans who are imbuing the systems with what they want the systems to do. Mm. So, so all kinds of, of uh, bad actors or malevolent humans or people who have intentions that they would like to have furthered through the machines. So then the AGI question is not necessarily about whether or not we can cohabit habit with intelligent machines, but have the intelligent machines been imbibed with intentions that do not serve human interests? Mm -hmm. And do they have the power to pursue those, those interests um, in a way that can, um, that can push aside humans? Mm. So that's the notion of that is the notion of bad AI or bad super intelligence or a singularity where you have intelligence that's much greater than humans that actually has intentions that don't serve our purposes. And the example has always been a computer's intentions is to create paper clips and it basically turns the whole universe into computers creating paper clips. Well, right. that's a metaphor for other intentions it could have. My sense is to ha to presume that you can have that kind of superintelligence that humans won't find ways of defeating if it gets out of hand. There's, there are giant leaps of faith in that, um, mm -hmm. giant presumptions. And the greater likelihood is that we are going to move toward human-centered AI, humans and computers working together, um, hum some enhanced humans, some computers with biological capabilities, and we are more likely to move into a future realm of intelligence that has many kinds of minds working together. In mm. fact, my basic my basic definitions of intelligence are collective. They are not autonomous or individuals. I may be an intelligent human being, but my intelligence is very much a product of culture and the people I interact with, the conversations I have, the, um, a whole melange of forces that are, that are really collective in nature and that it happens to manifest in this guy who's fairly glib at talking about some highfalutin things. Well, that just <laughs> happens to be what, what, you know, what I specialized in. Right. So what do you mean collective? Like, do you mean in the sense of like a hive mind equivalent in that way? Like where it's sort of, am I correct? Well, I don't know that it's as organized as a hive mind would be. Right. Or it's under that kind of control. But I mean, I spent uh, I spent two years of my life in the 1970s living in India. Right. So I imbibed Indian culture there. You know, I studied with Indian teachers. I I was initiated into their sensibilities in the same way as I was initiated by my my clarinet teacher into his sensibilities of how how to make that instrument you know sing you know right. and right. I, I never got it to sing that well but, but but the point is we are all a product of culture of interactions and that's happening in real time mm. and that's um, uh, and that's being formed by circumstances beyond our control. So now we're we're suddenly in a in a world where COVID nineteen exists. You know, that's a very different world than the world we were in just nine months ago. Oh, for sure. And we are all we are all restructuring our consciousnesses, our ways of interacting, our sensibilities, the questions asking in order to function within this COVID-19 world. Mm. 
So suddenly we are speeding up these digital interactions. Mm. I mean, we've done more Zooming <laughs> in, the, in the last uh, six to eight months than I have done in the previous, you know, five, ten years. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's just that we often get caught up in an egocentric, not only anthropomorphic, but an anthropomorphic, egocentric interpretation of what it means to be humans. And yet, what it really means to be humans is to be engaged in a social context, to be interacting, to, and uh, the only questions is, the only questions when you get to something like a hive mind is, how deep does that go? Mm. Or even Indian mysticism, how deep does that activity go? Mm. Hmm. I, um, I want to talk about um, ethics and and morality and context here. I want to I want to segue into that. But before that, I have just one more philosophical. I cannot avoid this question. And I've always wondered if with this, with this collective consciousness, where do we get intentionality? At that point, what is the motivation? Like it just it's just an absolute abstract philosophical question. Is that entertainable? That's entertainable, but but there are of course biological determinists mm -hmm. who have their answer to that, which is your intentionality is largely an illusion and it's, you know, and it's a product of intentions that are built into you by the processes of evolution and that it's largely um, your embodiment of, of surviving and reproducing in order to continue the species, but we happen to be a species that did it, that created our artificial environments, and therefore intentions get directed at possibilities. So there is that kind of an answer. Right. There's another kind of an answer, which is actually the one that interests me most, um, or at least another kind of a question, which is which actually informs all my reflections on ethics and what it means to be humans, and that is, um, what kind of capacity do we have to give form to our world? Mm. What's real and what's illusory? And uh, do we have do we have capacities that transcend the simple ca causalities of the interactions we have and that can be explained in a simple deterministic language? Um, that's that's been the intentional question of my lifetime. Mm. You know what ways we have of shaping the future through the present, or what mm. ways we have of realizing our desires, needs, goals. Do we have the capacity to form new intentions? And are those new intentions, um, can they be totally creative rather than just a product of applying our our, our psychoevolutionary heritage to the circumstances at hand. Right. Can we transcend is, is, is what it seems like, right? And we you think for transcending the deterministic aspect of what we are, we are clearly much more conditioned than we like to think. Mm -hmm. but, but are there even moments when you can al alter the trajectory of your very being? Mm -hmm. And if so, where does that come from? I happen to be a deep believer that actually you do have that capacity. And uh, and it it's something where um, I will take a moment and uh, give my endorsement of meditative practices and self-help psychology and so forth, but particularly meditative practices because I think um, Indian culture was contemplating this already 2,500 years ago in the Upanishadic era. Mm -hmm. And uh, they felt that there, well, I mean, uh, there are traditions within Indian philosophy that are very deterministic also. Mm -hmm. but, it's all laid out. but there are others that suggest, no, there's a, there's a capacity to introduce new intentionalities into the unfolding of a property of the of the manifest world, and that's by touching upon the the Shiva within you, the Purush within within you. So, um, I happen to believe that's true, but that's 
that's something that I'm trying to give expression to. There's not a lot of room for it within the philosophy of AI and the philosophy of materialism that tends to dominate Western thinking. In in that course, in this say in this enterprise to understand if we can introduce new intentionality into the future, something that might not be a copy of a copy of a copy, something something that might be you know rather original, not a redone, um, and ignoring, let's say AI for a second. I'm just curious if it ever came to your mind that ethics is the right place to approach building an algorithm for new intentionality or like is is there a relationship between your interest in ai ethics and this otherwise meaningful quest that you've been on all your life yes exactly you know and uh you know maybe to help the audience who doesn't know much about me i'm best known for a book called moral machines teaching robots right from wrong and moral machines was looking at the question of how we might introduce moral decision-making capacities into artificial entities and whether we could, what approaches we might take, and whether we wanted machines making moral decisions. Mm -hmm. So that was the explicit direction of it, and it mapped out that field, and it was the first book to do so. But the underbelly of it always was, well, how do humans make moral decisions? What comes into human moral decision-making? And ethics is often talked about largely in terms of rational logical systems. So, so utilitarianism, consequentialism, which is basically, well, the greatest good for the greatest number, the course of action, which, which maximizes the good, whatever good means. But, right. Or deontological, like um, uh, Yama and Niyama, or the Ten Commandments, those are deontological principles, and Immanuel Kant had a, had a philosophical theory where he reduced all of deontology to what he thought was one principle, the categorical imperative. imperative. It's right. all logical systems. Those systems are very approachable for artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is built on a logical platform. We humans were built on a biological platform. And to the extent that we have reason, it grew out of <clears throat> out of this biological platform. And we aren't very good at reasoning. We, we learn, we develop this discipline, we make a lot of mistakes, which are often talked about now in terms of cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have certain characteristics that are part of, of this biological platform. We are embodied in the world. Um, we, uh, we have a theory of mind, which means we have the capacity to deduce what is in other people's minds, what their goals and intentions are, so we can coordinate. We understand that they don't necessarily see the world as we do. At least that's our understanding if we aren't Donald Trump. But, but you do have narcissists who, who don't understand that. But Nevertheless, we have this, we have these capacities. We have a capacity for empathy, for altruism. We have an array of different capacities which are very much part of the kinds of biopsychological beings we, we are that differ from the technological systems we're creating. So for me, Moral Machines became as much about elucidating this fact that humans don't make moral decisions with reason alone. And, that, and in that sense, moral decisions became, moral machines became a book that looked much more comprehensively at human moral decision making than that it ever been looked at before. So I, yes, also think about ethics in terms of how do we perceive what our intentions are for the future and how might we be able to activate those in the present by the expression of our intentions in the present? Right. Am I correct in understanding? Sorry, were you no, going to say ahead. something? I was I going to, I was going to jump to, uh, I, I mean, I have a whole theory around this of humans as moral machines. Um, Let's do that. I'm very interested. <laughs> um, well, I basically argue 
The humans are moral machines in the sense that they are engaged in a process of never ending ad adaptation and integration. Mm -hmm. So to be a functional human being, you need to be integrated within yourself and have at least a functional integration with the environment you move through, including the animals and other humans that share that environment, let alone nature itself. So that becomes the essence of morality. How do we, how do we maximize that integration and how do we know when we are undermining both our ability to function as integrated beings, in which case we become diseased or divided or pulled in multiple directions. Um, I happen to think meditation is a lot about understanding how your thoughts on a very nascent level are integral to, to processes of division and how the resolution of thoughts and the returning to an inner quiet is an expression of integration. Mm. And it's kind of a theory I haven't fully published, but I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to find a, a way to express right now. I don't know that machines have the capacity for that kind of integration at all. I think they're very much kludges. Now we are we are kludges also. We have a lot of different mechanisms evolve evolutionarily and they don't all always work together, but we are engaged in this never ending real time struggle to be adaptive, to be integrated, to function to the highest degree. And to the extent that we have that integration, that opens up the possibility for, for more expansive states of mind or comfort in moving through the realms of states of mind and not running away from those that might be fearful or boring, but nevertheless contain information that is helpful in our process of, of flourishing. Mm. I often see this constant negotiation and renegotiation that I need to have with reality in that sense where it's, it's integration, adaptation, all of that to be very much, um, say, a good beginning point of description for the existential, say, burden that we all sort of have to carry, right? It's sort of like it's sort of like Sisyphus rolling the rock up the hill in, 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 in that limited regard. And um, I also understand that you know humans sort of have that ability or or, or that burden to carry, and it, the the funny part about figuring out morality is that there is just so much relativity to morality. So even if there can be say a unified theory of morality um, as to why humans might be moral, the substance that fills up that morality seems to deviate a lot from culture to culture. And that begs the question as far as a universal form of an AI is concerned, something that might be used anywhere. How do we begin mapping, if we cannot begin mapping our own moral code, a universal one, how do we then give it to a, a system instead? Well, I think it's, a, of course, what's the function of the system you're giving it to? Right. When I talk about morality, I often don't think about AGIs. I'm just talking about systems functioning in very limited realms and what do they need to know. So if they're functioning in the, the medical realm, then they need to know the principles of bio, bioethics. Uh, um, right. Not, uh, not so it's teleological in that sense. So in that sense, it's teleological. It's, it's grounded in the deontology, the utilitarianism <clears throat> that prevails with within that realm. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, you, you know, potentially you could have a robot that functioned within the Quran or mm -hmm. Yama, their moral code. Uh, if you are just trying to ensure that it functioned properly within certain situations that you decided that it encountered. So you only start getting into questions of universal morality when you start thinking about machines that are going to function in very broad contexts and have to make decisions for humanity as a whole. Hmm. And I think the difficulty in, in, in ethics is really whether ethics is grounded in anything fundamental Mm. Or whether ethics is only relativistic and grounded within cultures. Right. So when I start talking about, about our 
individual and collective need to be adaptive and integrative and so forth. I'm trying to point toward what I think is, is a universal, all pervasive quality mm -hmm. that is in for sure in biological systems and will have to be in any intentional system, any any non-biological system that that is to function intentionally or truly creatively. Mm. So again, that may initially only inform an individual morality, but to the extent that my my integration is not just internal but it's in relationship to to this socio-technical biological environment that i move through then transcendent states of mind become important mm -hmm. my ability to suspend the i-ness which is often very willfully intent on shaping the outer to conform to what i want the reality to be Mm. Again, if I can, you know, if I'm a Donald Trump who thinks that I should shape the universe to be what I think it should be, rather than accommodate dating, right. some of what it is informing me about what it is and what it needs and what its traditions are, then uh, then I'm just caught in my I-ness, my narcissism, mm -hmm. and the to me, the essence of spiritual paths has always been, well, how do you suspend that mm. in order to apprehend in the moment what is most reflective of the collective need in that moment, or the need of the, of the cosmos, or, or the environment, or, or the noosphere? It, it, it doesn't really matter what you call it, but for me, the value of a meditative practice has been the learning to suspend the sense of, of self to allow the information and a collective apprehension of the circumstance at hand and, and both allow collective intelligence and my individual intelligence to work with it in order to understand what to do next. Hmm. I use an example of that often from Indian history, hmm. and that's uh, Gandhi um, from 1924 after he was let out of prison, um, fresh on his own failure, feelings about the failure of his non-cooperative movement that it had turned violent. He went to his ashram and he basically weaved his dhotis and spin his cotton um, for, I think it was five years. Uh, and then one day he got up and he and 79 of his followers started to walk. And they walked for day after day after day until they reached the ocean. Uh, they made salt and they sold it, which was a violation of the British salt tax. And that and what followed on that in the, the coming weeks. But for me, the interesting thing is so here, Gandhi had semi-withdrawn. He did not know what to do next. How did after five years that he realize that this simple action could be one of the most profound? How did he understand that if he took this action, the follow-up, which, which a month later became marching on, on a salt warehouse non-violently where Indian after Indian was struck down, and where uh, a New York reporter said that moral authority had been taken from the British and, and given to the Indians in their fight for independence by that non -violent. How did he know he could rely upon his mm. followers point to act non-violently? So to me, that's all part of a collective process. And that's part of, of an intentional mind looking for an opportunity to make a difference through an action in the present that will reshape the future. Hmm. Hmm. I have, um, <clears throat> I used to have a friend back at Columbia who was primarily doing research as far as um, artificial intelligence was concerned with view of the fact, and I may get this incorrectly, but let me try. I think she was doing something to the effect of she'd figured out that the data that artificial intelligence 
would be using for um, executing decisions in the future will come from human records. And that because of human bias in existing data could corrupt and for that matter solidify. That's actually become a big theme now. That's in in the world of AI ethics. Okay, so let's, I I just took us into the stratosphere. <laughs> right, 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 right. I had to, to bring us back, yes. Let's come back to where AI ethics is right now. So AI ethics right now encountered some very tangible problems in terms of the machine, machines we're building today. One of those problems was, one of the first problems was lethal autonomous weapons. Hmm. How do we ensure that AI systems aren't, aren't built um, in ways where they might act unpredictably and start new wars or escalate existing wars. So how do we defuse the use of autonomous systems or rely on autonomous system? The second problem, which is related to that, is the unpredictability of AI. We don't know how deep learning systems, we know about input and output, but we don't know how they got from the input to the output. So it's not transparent what they're doing. A third issue is exactly what your what your um, colleague was coming upon, and that was the recognition that if the input, the output is biased, mm. and systems function on massive amounts of, of information. That's what a deep learning system does. It takes massive amounts of information and it finds salient relationships in them, and it points out those salient relationships to be used by 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 humans on the output side and if those if the if the output side says you should not hire this person but saying don't hire them for a totally biased reason because it doesn't like hindus or muslims or something like that that's the data it's working under even if it's not explicit that the person is a, a hindu and muslim it's nevertheless deducing things from neighborhoods and other kinds of records so how do we get beyond algorithmic bias? And it's not like we know how to get beyond it yet. But the point was this and threats to privacy gave birth to what now is this mass AI ethics movement. People like me, you know, we're just, we were just kind of gadflies kind of out there, carmudgeons. What about this? What about that? Right. Suddenly we have this massive AI ethics movement. And what the first level of what we've seen is this creation of value of, of various rules or values. And there's actually 80 or 90 of them, but they all have something about algorithmic bias in it. They all have something about transparency. They all have something about privacy. Then a lot of them have, have broader principles because when people got to think about ethics, they started to realize, well, we're reshaping this is an inflection point in human history. Right. We're reshaping human history. What kind of future do they want? So they say, oh, well, we got to have human rights in there. The Chinese don't like human rights so much. So they put harmony in there. But but you understand, we got into these much broader values that actually inform these systems. But yes, this recognition of algorithmic bias was one of the central issues that, that drove us toward thinking about AI ethics as something essential, something that that ha that engineers have to work from and the company, corporations and, uh, and governments need to demand before systems are deployed. Now that said, we have these broad principles. Putting those principles into practice is a much is a much more difficult issue. And that's now why we're moving much more toward, well, what kind of policies do you put in place and what kinds of governmental mechanisms? So I'm as well known these days for, for AI governance as I am for AI ethics because I have been, um, I, with colleagues, I put forward some of the basic models people are using to think about governance, particularly international governance. And I've been organizing something called the International Congress for the Governance of Artificial Intelligence, which was to have been in Prague last uh, April, is now rescheduled for May in Prague, but it's pretty iffy mm -hmm. that we'll be able to, to have it then. So, 
So that's sort of a long answer to your point about bias, because bias is central. And I think as soon as we've seen bias, we start to see, well, getting ethics out of AI is not going to be simple. No, it's like discovering the golden mean to a problem you don't even understand. Like, you know, it's like if I if I put in something that's anti-bias, does that create its own bias? Then how do I create the dialectic so it keeps arriving at sort of the center point? Uh, there's certain kinds of biases that we, we actually want that are useful. I mean, um, in psychology, you know, this explosion of interest in cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, then Kahn Kahneman and Tversky win the, the Nobel Prize. Well, Tversky doesn't because he's dead and the Nobel Prize goes to the living member. But, but Kahneman wins the Nobel Prize for this. And it's one of the biggest ideas in the world of cognitive psychology. For such and a long time, yes. For such a long time. Um, and on one level, it's saying, well, we have these cognitive biases are very useful. They're often accurate and they allow us to act very quickly but sometimes they're really stupid. Right. And, and that for that reason, humans are really stupid. And then we get into the realm of, will, will AI have these cognitive biases or won't it? Can it be rational in ways that humans aren't rational? And if it can, then it's better than humans in decision-making. And then others said, no, 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 <laughs> it has its own cognitive biases, uh, you know, and this gave birth to a whole movement called AI safety or human-centered AI. How do we ensure that AI has the values right. that, that further human ends? Right, right. Um, I mean, <clears throat> that that that's all the line of reasoning, line of questioning from my side. I'd like to move to the audience. I'm sure there's a few people who are interested in asking questions. Just but before we get to a question, let me right. say that this has been a wonderful discussion for me. I very seldom get to talk about the territory this broadly. and uh, um, That makes uh, my day, Mr. Wallach. I, I really want to thank you for that. Thank you so much. No, the, the, the pleasure is all mine. I'm, when, I, when I'm in a conversation, at least as far as a conversation on the screen is concerned recently, my job is to make the other person think as much as I'm thinking. Um, and if I can get to that, I can see a smile on their face and that makes my day. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank you. Admin team, do you want to take over? Time. Yeah, that was a great session. Uh, I'm just gonna look for a few questions or anything like that. I do have I do have one of one question that I have for myself. The question is like you know it's a question is one hundred percent hypothetical. I'm cracking up. Humans and I'm um, all right. I'm sorry. I think I think uh, this is this all right? Yes, it is you better. Yes. Me okay. Speak okay. very slowly though. Okay. Okay. Okay, so when we talk about like, you know, machine and human singularity, like, you know, someday, what if like, you know, machines are so evolved so that they could live in symbiotic relationship with us, all right? So in such a place, like, you know, the idea is like, you know, I'll just, we'll just talk about evolution. Like, you know, how did we evolve to the top of the food chain? I won't say we are the most evolved people, but I would say we are at the top of the food chain. How, it's not because of the brawny, like, you know, jaws and teeth that we have, but instead because of our mental abilities, like, you know, we, we were able to create tools, you know, physical tools like cages and stuff, etc. And we, we've also created mental tools like conditioning, taming, etc. right? So we've, that's how we've climbed to the top of the food chain. So when we're creating when we're creating a being, essentially an AGI, which is as intelligent as us, or probably more, like, you know, we don't know, you, we don't even know how, how to define intelligence. So what's to say that they won't do the same? What's to say that they won't do the same to us? Like, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Like, you know, this is a hypothetical situation, I know, but what are your thoughts on such kind of a situation? No, but it's a hypothetical situation that many people have actually given attention to. And yeah. that's part of why they got the universe. I mean, we had people like Eliezer Yudkowsky and Nick Bostrom who started to underscore for people, well, uh, what happens if we succeed with AI? And then if they get artificial intelligence, general intelligence, which is comparable to humans, how long before they have artificial super intelligence? And we actually had a, a, a theorist, I Jay Good, who goes back much earlier than our modern era of AI, who said you'd get an intelligence explosion very quickly. 
Mm. So they would they would have exponential growth in their intelligence. And it's exactly that thinking that has given this fearful concern around, you know, whether their goals and intentions will include humans or might be harmful to humans or become a dictatorship uh, of the AI or just uh, they'll eliminate humans because we're just getting in the way stupid cognitive bias. Too much waste, too much waste. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. They're both. So that's, that, that's the whole question. That's what set all of this in motion, that, that the very question you're put there, it's not like anybody has an answer to it. And it's for that reason that people like Stuart Russell um, and others are pushing for friendly AI, that we now take steps to try and ensure that the AIs we create will not be of that nature. But we have a larger problem going on. Even that is thinking about all of this very, very narrowly because we also have human enhancement technologies yeah. being developed. Yeah. And we um, already, already have structural inequalities among humans and the domination of those, let's say, in the, in the tech oligopoly who have power to, uh, to prevail over humans. And you're going to have humans combining with artificial intelligence and perhaps giving form to a symbiotic superintelligence which raises a much deeper question for me and is why I've started a totally new project, um, which is AI inequality. Will AI really just exacerbate structural inequalities and create new forms of inequality or can it be used to ameliorate inequality or is this talk about good AI just kind of ethics washing trying to gild a lily that is actually quite poisonous hmm. Hmm. great i mean that was a great answer to it i do have another question though like you know when we're talking about another question yeah it's, it's, it's like you know the question the fun i think this this i mean i think this is one of the fundamental philosophical questions that we as humans would have ever asked that is who am i right like you know i don't think anyone has definitively given an answer to who am i like you know so when when we don't understand ourselves to like you know exactly what consciousness is like you know how am i alive how is some you know, how is some animal or whatever how is it alive and what is all of this so when we don't understand what consciousness is how do we really hope to create an agi how do we really hope to create something which represents consciousness we don't even know how, what it is in the first place so do you think like you know in this path like you know in this path of actually trying to create an agi we might you know, someday stumble upon the answer to who am I? That's you, don't the question. Ramana, you don't think Ramana Maharshi answered that question? Um, Ramana Maharshi spent his, his lifetime at Arunachala, well, at least a significant portion of it, asking that question, and then he came to discover there is no I. Okay. And that he was the collectivity. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Hinged, let's say, on a on a particular life form, but the only thing I want to get, the only reason I'm going to Ramana Maharshi is where well, we actually see that reflected in contemporary psychology, where we cannot find an I in in the human mind body, or at least we can't find a center of consciousness. Nor do we find, by the way, um, uh, a moral compass within right. the human body. Um, so we seem to be um, we seem to be a, a process engaged in filtering life through a particular history, a particular set of, of, of biases and and interests. And and my point only in all of this is well, when you start thinking in the sum of that way, you you get back to the same fundamental question: is in theory, is there any of that that an artificial entity could not participate in? Yeah. And there's always somebody out there who will, who will rationalize how an artificial entity could participate in that. Yeah. Mm. In computing, if it requires biological material, you integrate the biological material. But but theory can theory can rationalize anything. Right. So whether we can actually realize any of that. That, that's a, a very different story. 
I mean, yeah, I do understand that, but you know, it's just the kind of an extrapolation of my question. I just see. I mean, there, there, there have been many attempts to like, you know, explain who am I, right? But can that be? Can that philosophy or like, you know, anything that the, the answers can that be translated into recreating, so recreating a being which is conscious, which is conscious? So because I think like, you know, if we had understood that, and if we had understood what consciousness is in at its, at its, at its fundamental core. we should be able to recreate it right so i mean i understand say polynomials i i am able to play with them so in the same way if we could have understood like you know in theory at least at least we could have understood what consciousness is and what uh, like you know who am i to the question of what's the real answer to that should we not be able to recreate it so well if if we can understand it yeah yes and even if we can't understand it but we know know how it's function well mm-hmm. the ai world is all built built upon a kind of functional view of psychology that's so how to reproduce a, a function so let's say dualism is correct and the consciousness is a product of something you know purush you know something outside of the manifest universe a uh, shiva okay. uh, that's uh, um the indian philosophy of that Well, that doesn't alter the fact that we as biological beings have the capacity to participate in that. So even if you have a kind of more mystical notion of, of consciousness, consciousness is still something that in some non-dualistic sense functions through the human body and yeah. we have this sense of what it means to be me, what it means to be a human. So in theory, again, the AI believe the true believers will argue that ai can participate in that but some other people say no it's so biological that only an evolved creature could mm. participate in that so again these are the questions that you will have the joy of of contemplating for yeah. the rest of your life <laughs> the joy it's why for the torment right <laughs> what well, you will be on the cross to bring in a little trick to <laughs> this but it's why the philosophy of ai is such a fascinating subject it's why ai and cognitive science in general have brought us a new rich language to ponder some of the same old classical questions that gave birth to the vedas mm. yeah I mean like yeah thanks a lot for answering that I mean I don't know if I'm completely clear with that but I'm definitely satisfied with the answer the whole point is you wait through time for the answers in theory <laughs> it's possible right but uh-huh, the rest yeah. of it is the rest of it is for us to wait in time for I mean I yeah. think it's not just waiting it's participating in the inquiry to really sure. to engage it but you know as i say i went to india to meditate and learn from 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 those wise people who are available at that time and and i think now i my questions are not about you know enlightenment they're of <laughs> they're about how much understanding can be realized through this entity through this historical body going going right. through time and there may be limits of what can be understood it may be the consciousness can be can be inquired into and explored but never fully understood you know i don't know but that's what makes my life so vital is i i utilize my life as an inquiry into how much self understanding can be realized within this rather limited foolish often often um what shall i say fumbling mm. logical being right All right. Yeah. Okay. There's another question, though. That is, I mean, <laughs> I do have questions. I do have questions. Do you so, have, do you have audience questions too? I mean, I, 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 I'm just concerned about how much time we have here. That we uh, do have time, but I don't really think the, there's a lot of people asking questions here. So I'm just clearing clearing up the questions that I have in my head. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So the the other question is, can I just so want to? Questions will go on through your lifetime. Yeah. So we're, okay. we're just getting to those that we can today, and I'm interact. 
Okay, the question that I have right now, I think you'll be able to answer it definitively. I'm not sure though, but still, yeah, I'm gonna try. The question is like, you know, what each of you like, you know, what each of you like, you know, are like, you know, really eager or looking forward to, to be answered in the quest of actually cre recreating an AGI, creating an AGI, like in the quest of us trying to rec recreate consciousness, and in the quest of us trying to create an AGI which is intelligent enough as us and can think like us and has some so, some sort of consciousness in it. So in this quest, what are what are the things each of you are like? You know, most interested in finding out. Like you know, they might. Be, I don't know what what we might find out, but what are the things that you guys might hope you will find out in this quest? Prakal, why don't you take that first? Yep, I'll do that. Um, I'm I'm interested in this, um, I'm interested in where say the randomness for creativity emerges. Like at what point does um, the assembly of the many parts in my head lead to something authentic, original and valuable? And how does that even come to be? And so for me, it's that for me, it's understanding if, if at all is possible, the 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 algorithm that leads up to say something like that. OK, but by, by that you mean like, you know, an, an algorithm which kind of replicates the way your brain thinks, uh, the creative side of your brain, is that? Is the that... algorithm is a way of thinking about it, right? The algorithm is yeah. also the language that, say, a system speaks, but more so in the sense of. I mean, I understand logic. I'm sort of mm -hmm. bored by logic by now, you know, like yeah. it's 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 too on my face. Where is the where is the tension? Where is the absurdity? Like what what yeah. what makes the absurd the absurd? Like, you know, where is the yeah. humor? And so it's it's those dancey flowery parts of life that don't make sense to me that mm. that would um, that would make me cheer up a lot more than just <laughs> how to get from point A to point B, you know. Uh, interesting, definitely interesting. So my, my answer is similar. My answer is to what extent can our higher order capabilities, whether that's consciousness or creativity or intentionality or, or um, empathy, to what extent can these be reproduced by computational means? And if they are, and if they are reproduced, will we think of them as being authentic, or will we, or will we see them as largely jerry rigged? Mm -hmm. You know, you know. Can we? Um, and I think that's one of the questions we're exploring. Yeah. I'm I'm circumspect about whether I want us to explore it to the extent of AGI if we can't ensure that AGI will will care about humans because if we can't yeah. give it empathy or the ability to care then um then i think that's that's not the path we want to be going down and we should much much less focused on autonomous systems and more focused on how we integrate systems with various forms of artificial intelligence into the commerce of human community yeah um, okay, I do have like a statement that is like, you know, since we're talking about uh, like, you know, artificially understanding higher cognitive processes like creativity and stuff like that. But I often like, you know, wonder like, you know, instead of us trying like, you know, really hard understanding in that, why like, you know, what, what exactly is common sense? Common sense is like, you know, even a kid has a common sense, right? Like, you know, that's something fundamental, like, you know, any kid, even though like, he's not very intelligent or very smart or very creative, he does have common sense. He does use common sense. Right. So, do we do we really understand what common sense is? I just I'm just leaving an open-ended question as such. You know, if any, yeah, please, no. please go so ahead. When 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 we talk about artificial intelligence, there's mm -hmm. there's about three or four different areas that we use as broad brush strokes for what we don't know how to produce in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, and that's emotions, and that's common sense reasoning. And that's consciousness. Those are kind of the three big mysteries. Yeah. Now, in that AI can be rational, then maybe we can get pretty close to common sense reasoning. But that, but common sense reasoning also depends upon having some semantic understanding, understanding the meaning of things, and 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 we get that through a whole process of enculturation let alone that we probably bring consciousness into that and emotions into that in ways that we don't know whether artificial intelligence can. So artificial intelligence will be smart or maybe even come up with 
more logical reasons, but whether it's what we call common sense reasoning, even if it looks like it, I'm not sure it will be. Mm. I mean, I just want to like elaborate on the point that you just said. You just said like, you know, if AI were to be rational, I mean, could you like elaborate on what do you mean by rational? Because I think rational can be defined, I mean, can be subjective in some senses. So could you just elaborate on what do you mean by if AI system can be rational enough? Well, I mean, AI, I, AI systems are built on logical platforms. Yes, yes. So they are able to be more logical than we humans tend to be. Yeah. Because we bring all kinds of other qualities into, into our reasons, into our rationality. And sometimes some of that's very stupid but sometimes that informs our reasons in a way in which, uh, which we might not otherwise. So there's a very famous case that has been uh, explored deeply by, uh, by uh, a psychologist, uh, uh, Demacio, mm -hmm. and, it's, it, and it, it largely underscored the fact that it was, uh, it was an individual whose brain had there was severs between his logical brain and his emotional brain. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the point was he was able to engage in very exquisite reasoning about what to do, but he couldn't make simple decisions such as when to schedule an appointment. Yeah. And, and Damasio brought this out and they refer to this individual as Elliot, uh, as saying that, um, that emotions seem to be a central, as, essential to our reasoning, to our mm. intentionality, to our functioning. Uh, well, none of that exists within artificial intelligence. And at this moment, even if we think about bringing in emotional intelligence, it's nothing more than kind of a, a waiting mechanism, but it's not, it has by no means the rich affective content where you take in massive amounts of sensory experience and then say, okay, I want chocolate ice cream, not vanilla. Okay. Um, I, I, have, yeah, I'm please. sorry. I, I'm sorry. I have to interrupt. I do have to be somewhere. Um, so okay. I think I'll have to take your leave. I think the session has been great. Um, yeah. I think, I think Mr. Wallach's been, I think he's been dogged by questions for long enough now. Um, but thank you so much, Mr. Wallach for doing this. Thank you so much audience. This has been absolutely fun. And thank you so much mind Act team for putting this together. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you, right. Thank you for yeah. inviting me. I had a great time. Mm -hmm. Yeah.